I also want to announce that next week <clears throat> we will have no press briefing uh, simply because the uh, third quadripartite meeting, uh, which is a meeting between uh, the uh, Dutch government, the French government, uh, the St. Martin government, and the government of the Collectivité, uh, so North and South St. Martin, French and Dutch. The first quadripartite was held in the Netherlands. The second one was held on uh, French St. Martin. The third one will be held in Philipsburg, and the fourth one then would be scheduled for sometime next year in Paris, as it was agreed upon that the meeting will rotate every year in one of the different territories. This year, the meeting will be held next week, Wednesday, and it will start uh, right here in the AC Wati Hall uh, from 8 o'clock in the morning. So as such, we will not have any press briefing next week. We do apologize up front for that. Um, some of the issues that we will be uh, discussing in the quadripartite uh, would be uh, would have to do with military cooperation, uh, so the general overview and the status of the agreement that exists. Uh, we will also be discussing uh, the border control uh, issues between uh, the two sides of the island, police cooperation. As you know, there is a signed agreement on police cooperation, and now the discussion will be uh, continued on the implementation of it. Um, also, one of the issues would be treaties that are in uh, preparation and the cross-border cooperation between uh, the two sides of the island, which will include uh, things such as uh, education, healthcare, social welfare. Uh, we also want to actually establish a cooperation structure uh, between uh, St. Martin, um, both sides, and also uh, the French side, because there is quite some presence, if you want to put it that way, of the French uh, government and French influence uh, through the profess. So we want to establish a cooperation structure. Um, on the agenda, we would also have issues such as European Union affairs and follow-up arrangements on the discussions that we've been having and the planning for the next meeting. Um, before the Easter holidays, I was in Aruba actually on two occasions. Uh, the first one was for the celebration of the 30th anniversary of separate status for Aruba and the commemoration of the 40th anniversary of the unveiling of their flag. Uh, it was um, a well-attended event. Uh, the cultural uh, and official presentation uh, was a tremendous display of nationalism and patriotism. Uh, the special songs that were written for the event and actually you know, having a review of where Aruba was, where it came from, and where it is heading. Uh, it was um, a really memorably, memorable event, and of course our congratulations to the government of Mike Imam and the team that has put that together. Then I returned on Monday last back to Aruba to attend a Petrie conference, uh, which was a conference organized, P3A, uh, which is a conference that was organized um, by Aruba in partnership with the United Nations Office, and then you get a very long name, the United Nations Office of the High Representative for the Least Developed Countries, Landlocked Developing Countries, and Small Island Development States. Um, that had to do with um, public-private partnership in support of sustainable development on small island development states. The SIDS that was held in Aruba from the 22nd to the 24th of March. 
Interestingly, we had countries from something like 38 uh, different uh, nations. Um, some of them, I even forgot my geography uh, that they existed. You know, we had people from the Maldives. Uh, we had people from Samoa. We had people from Alaska. Uh, there were people from uh, Seychelles, but also from uh, countries in the region uh, such as Antigua, St. Kitts, uh, and uh, Guyana, and other countries uh, throughout the region. Um, that too was an interesting event. Presentations and uh, panel discussions were held on a daily basis. And looking at the time, I would also, on behalf of the uh, government and people of St. Martin, um, extend uh, congratulations to Madame Fleming, uh, from the uh, French side, who today is celebrating her 100th anniversary, her birthday anniversary. Um, as I would you know, like to put it, uh, she's one of my role models in the sense that I plan to be 112. Uh, so looking at uh, where she's at at 100, uh, sound at mine and in good health, I think that's the way to go. So we would like to I would like to, on behalf of the government and people of St. Martin, extend our uh, congratulations and wish her continued uh, good health and success in all her undertaking. With regards to um, the situation regarding the uh, sewage plant and the EU discussions and the, some of the guidelines that they are setting. There are a number of people that are complaining about the location, which you spoke about already. But now Parliament is calling a meeting and probably would like to have a tour of that area. Um, what's your thought on this? I, know, I think uh, what Parliament is doing is, is uh, actually uh, doing their job as well. Parliament, besides legislation, uh, one of the um, important aspects uh, of, of uh, responsibilities actually of parliament is to supervise and control the operations of government. So if government is planning to build a sewage plant in a particular location that uh, is, is, is creating uh, some discussion and some buzz, uh, it behooves parliament uh, to look into the, the matter and um, from what I understood, uh, they were organizing a tour of the lagoon, um, not only uh, will they be looking at the location, I think uh, you don't need to tour the entire lagoon to look at the location because it's not like you're surveying to see which is the best location. But I think one of the things that they will be looking at as well is the many outlets um, of uh, drainage pipes that are running directly into the lagoon. And I can, I do not have it here with me, but I can show you um, pictures uh, that were taken and surveys that were made. And I think there's some 28, I think, uh, locations where there are drainages uh, that are actually running straight into the lagoon as if the lagoon was uh, the switch plant. Um, it is interesting to see some of the people who are making uh, a lot of uh, 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 commotion about this, and I think rightfully so. Uh, but then, um, aren't they aware of the situation that we have ongoing, the existing situation as is? So yes, uh, they should be concerned about every time government uh, tampers let's say with a lagoon, but I think it should be even more so that people should be worried and should be out there protesting and should be out there uh, 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 raising their voices of when they should see the amount of raw sewage that is penetrating the lagoon on a daily basis, morning, noon, and night. And the longer we focus on government's intention uh, to clean it up, rather than looking at what will be the consequences if we do not clean it up, that in the next couple of years there will be no lagoon basically 
uh, to talk about other than a polluted area of water. Thank you so much, uh, Minister Prime, Prime Minister Marlin. Thank you very much for your questions, Bibi. Alita Singh, you have the floor. Mr. Anandam, Mr. Jacobs. Prime Minister, there was a cleanup of the civil registry where a number of people, um, their na Dutch nationality was either rescinded, taken back. Um, do you have an update on how that has, um, has progressed, as how many people have been able to clear up their issues, have been able to get back their nationality? No, I do not have uh, an update in figures. I can um, get that information and, and share with you, but I know it has been an issue that was of concern uh, ever since when, way back when I was in Parliament. Um, it's an issue that we have broached with the Dutch government, uh, that it is, uh, in our discussions with the IPCO, uh, that it is um, basically against uh, human rights. You cannot have, we have cases, uh, several cases. Um, of course, you know, over the years there were cases where people, um, let's say committed fraud. It was clear that someone uh, committed fraud. But there's this one case uh, that I, 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 I know about that, that was you know, so, so heart-wrenching. Uh, a young lady who was adopted uh, or recognized, adopted when she was, uh, according to the story, like three months before she made 18, was living at the time in Stacia uh, when she was adopted by the father. The actual picking up of the documents took place two months after she was 18, but the, red, the adoption took place three months before she was 18. She went on to move to St. Martin, uh, had something like five passports renewed thereafter, is married, three children, all three children born in St. Martin, all three children having the Dutch nationality. And after voting uh, for some four or five elections and having uh, something like five passports, you are then being told suddenly upon renewing the passport that proper procedures were not followed over 20 years ago and yet you are actually not Dutch. Uh, the person ends up now basically without a nationality children who were born with the Dutch nationality and have had no other nationality uh, rendered uh, stateless without any nationality. And, and these, things, these things are not right. Uh, these things uh, should be addressed. And uh, yeah, they're being addressed now. She's being told that uh, she can apply for Dutch nationality and uh, they will fast track it. But one of the other issues that you have is that now there's a requirement of the Dutch exam, uh, which poses another hindrance uh, because the person uh, is no longer 18 years and did not, uh, you know, does not master the Dutch sufficiently, and that becomes now an added burden to it. The the whole issue of of, of language is one of the things that we've also uh, been discussing. In the, in the IPCO as Dutch and English are official languages of the kingdom. And we believe that if people are living in a part of the kingdom where English is the language that we speak, um, the, the people who have settled here, um, it, it is asking so much of them to, to take an exam in the Dutch language uh, because they're getting a passport. While what you have as an example, if you want to, let's say, turn the tables, if someone, let's say, from, from, from one of the uh, East European countries or from, from one of the African countries, wherever, somebody migrates to Holland and they don't speak English, and uh, they live in Holland, they don't speak English, and they live in Holland for a number of years, and acquire the Dutch nationality, um, which gave them the right, uh, let's say, to come to St. Martin as Dutch citizens, uh, then what are we to tell them? Uh, you are not welcome uh, because you do not master the English language that we communicate in, and you are not uh, part of our cultural 
uh, inheritance here in, in, in the Dutch part of the kingdom. So if you have a, a Dutch Caribbean part, or you have a, a Caribbean part of the kingdom where English is widely spoken, I think it is only fair that people be given the opportunity, yes, that you need to know things about the kingdom that you're going to be part of, I agree, but that it has to be an exam that is in Dutch, a language that they probably will never again use in their life. When we even look at children born and raised in St. Martin, um, the amount of them that go to school from kindergarten through high school and college and do not uh, have Dutch as language of instruction. Uh, it is becoming more and more, and uh, you do not um, make us more part of the kingdom by um, forcing one to take a Dutch exam um, while there are others who born with a Dutch nationality and never speak one word of Dutch probably for the rest of their lives. Uh, on electoral reform, um, of course, you've had time to look over the report from the Electoral Reform Committee. Uh, can you give any details on that now? Um, well, the, the, because of travel and sickness schedules of uh, myself and others in the committee, uh, we have not been able to um, finalize the discussion to move it to the next step. As a matter of fact, that discussion is to take place uh, today uh, with the chairman of the committee. Um, but um, two, of the, uh, two of the highlights in the report, um, because I've asked them to take along also amendments uh, to allow um, the students to vote. Uh, what they have done is prepared an amendment to allow uh, people who have lived on St. Martin uh, for um, at least 10 years uh, that they are eligible to vote. So what it does, it opens up the possibility for somebody who has lived on St. Martin 10 years, um, has moved out of St. Martin, is no longer living in St. Martin, but give them the right, the possibility to vote, which is very similar to what uh, is done in the Netherlands. So St. Martiners who have studied and have lived in Holland for 10 years or more upon returning to St. Martin or to any other uh, part of the kingdom, they are allowed to vote. Um, I have not uh, been able to, because I, I read over that one uh, hurriedly, so I'm not sure whether it is in anywhere in the world that you live or if it is living in the within the Dutch kingdom. If it is living with Dutch, within the Dutch kingdom, it would give our students in Curaçao, Aruba, uh, and the Netherlands the opportunity to vote, but then it would exclude St. Martin students who have moved to the USA or to other Caribbean islands. If it includes um, anyone who has moved to anywhere in the world, uh, then it creates an organizational challenge uh, because you would have uh, persons who have moved uh, to, to Guyana, or persons who have moved to St. Lucia, Dominica, persons who have moved to Anguilla, persons who have moved to all over the world, um, or are living in other parts of the world, and then you are creating uh, that, 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 that opportunity for them. So that is one of the things that we need to look at and see how we can address the issue that we really want to address, which is allowing our students who are abroad to study, uh, to vote. Uh, the, the approach that they have uh, taken, the advice that they have rendered so far on um, the, 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 the ship jumping is that um, in their proposal they're saying to, um, that in for someone, for the, go the government, so the ministers need to have support of a majority um, coming from the parties that nominate them. So uh, let's say for a person to be appointed minister, that person needs to have uh, the approval of a majority of persons 
uh, supporting the parties. So if one would no longer support his party, that one person can no longer uh, make or support a nomination for a minister. Uh, so it's a different uh, approach, but at the end of the day, you would basically get the same effect. So if someone uh, would declare him or herself independent uh, and say, I am no longer part of that faction, then that person cannot support the nomination of a minister. So they have inserted uh, one paragraph that would um, make it mandatory for a minister to be supported by uh, members of parliament, but belonging to the political parties that support the government. So if I declare myself independent and I'm no longer part of the political party upon which I was elected, I cannot nominate a minister or support a minister. This morning I would like to clarify a statement that was made, that made headlines in the Daily Herald newspaper today, Wednesday, March the 30th. The headline said, JetBlue not stopping service to St. Martin. JetBlue is indeed dropping its daily San Juan St. Martin route due to underperformance of this route. The service will cease as of May the 3rd, and JetBlue did indeed announce this service cancellation. However, I must state that JetBlue's other services, the JFK Boston service, did not cease their operation. The airline will continue these two services and presently are conducting its due diligence considering in the introduction of its main service, which is being offered to the other Caribbean destinations on the JFK St. Martin route, which is presently flying to St. Martin. The airline main service includes the top-notch stylish seats with the option of massage, special check-ins, early boarding, non-stop entertainment on board, menus, complimentary board fly service, Wi-Fi, and this service which is being offered to the other Caribbean destinations we are exploring the uh, possibility of offering this service as well on the GFK St. Martin route, which will enhance the experience of these customers coming to the island. JetBlue is presently conducting their due diligence, and we, this ministry, together with the Tourist Bureau and the stakeholders, are conducting our due diligence as well to see if this service is profitable and for us to continue to service the route that is presently flying from the JFK to St. Martin. Uh, I had a meeting the, with Mr. Dave Clark. He's the Vice President of Network Planning on March the 23rd to explore the possibility of servicing the St. Martin Fort Lauderdale route. This request was accepted with great interest and Mr. Clark has invited us for an in-person meeting where we can further discuss the options and possibilities of exploring this route together with the airport and the stakeholders. So I must say that we are in conversation with JetBlue. We do have the service and we are looking at other options in getting the Fort Lauderdale St. Martin service as well in operation. I feel like I've been away for quite a while. I don't think it's only been a week, but it feels like a long time. So. Even though we've had some press releases going out this week already, um, I do have some new information specifically from the Department of Culture regarding a cultural heritage essay contest registration which is ongoing. The Department of Culture within the ministry through the 2013-23 Decade of Revitalizing our Natural and Cultural Heritage campaign officially launched the first interscholastic essay competition on intangible heritage amongst St. Martin secondary school juniors and seniors so that of those are from forms three to five or nine to twelve under the age of 19 as well as pre-university students who are also eligible to participate the registration is ongoing and the last day for submission is friday april 22nd as saint martin is an associate member of the united nations 
Education, Scientific and Cultural Organization, known as UNESCO, and has recognized that the United Nations has declared 215 to 24, the International Decade of People of African Descent. The topic of the essay competition, in keeping with that theme of recognition, justice, and development, is to describe the global impact of people of African descent from your perspective. The department aims to encourage and reward young students in various aspects of culture and the arts, for example, in the field of literary arts and promote St. Martin's natural and cultural heritage via strategic initiatives and special projects that are in line with the wider governing program, the ministry year plan, as well as the department cultural policy framework. So I encourage our young writers out there to take this opportunity to take part in this essay contest. Also, the department talent scholarship policy is being executed. Uh, the department is busy developing the policy. However, um, scholarships for talent has been awarded in the past. As a matter of fact, it is a short-term scholarship that provides students in the field of arts the opportunity to enhance their skills in the disciplines such as dance, acting, vocal training, etc. It ensures the students between the age of 15 and 28 that are, um, would like the opportunity to apply for a talent scholarship of which two scholarships will be granted annually. Um, into 14 and 15, a total of nine such scholarships were granted. So during those two years, past recipients of these scholarship programs are Ms. Francia Adamas, Ms. Leanne Borsha, Mr. Delaney Antoine, Ms. Natori Illich, Mr. Jabari York, Ms. Bianca Dykoff. Currently, three students are currently a bro uh, Sorry. Three students are currently abroad completing their programs, namely Mr. Fernando van der Kratz, Mr. Giovanni Webster, and Ms. Tyra Els, with the help of the funding they've received from the talent scholarships. The ministry would also like to announce that the official release of the talent scholarship and application procedures will be made public in the near future so that others can apply. Should you have any questions, do contact the Department of Culture at 542-2056. Also on the Cultural Department agenda is the remeasurement and redelineation of boundaries and buffer zones of registered monuments. The ministry, as the minister is a gatekeeper of the country's patrimony and as such keeps a public register of protected monuments. The ministry is currently busy with the remeasuring of the national registered monuments whereby each monument that is designated as such will receive a cadastral deed allowing the owner of the property with the option of developing the other parts of the property which is not designated as a registered monument. This is a major shift from the existing situation where the property owners hands were tied because the entire property was designated as a monument and therefore they could do nothing else to develop their property. In February of this year, the remeasurement project and redelineation of the boundaries and the buffer zones of the registered monument started and is currently ongoing. The Department of Culture continues to seek the cooperation of property owners and the general public in cooperation with carrying out this very important project.